When the Lord said to Nathanael, Hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man, I have no doubt that he's referring to the dream of Jacob. And he dreamed, this is Genesis 28, 12, and he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth. And the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. So we know right off the bat that that ladder is the Lord Jesus Christ. I've entitled this message, The Ladder You Don't Climb. The Ladder You Don't Climb. When I was in grade school, we sang a lot of different songs. Among them were, We Are Climbing Jacob's Ladder. Maybe some of you all sung that in school. Here's the words, we are climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder, soldiers of the cross. Every rung goes higher and higher. Every rung goes higher and higher. Every rung goes higher and higher. Soldiers of the cross. Keep on climbing, we will make it. Keep on climbing, we will make it. Keep on climbing, we will make it. Soldiers of the cross. Now there's a reason I strongly believe in separation of church and state. <laughs> I don't want people teaching my children the gospel because they don't know it. And uh, this song that we actually sang in state-sponsored public schools was completely contrary to what Jacob's Ladder means in the first place. It had this as steps you take to reach heaven. Steps, rungs you climb, you keep getting closer. And that has less than nothing and is actually contrary to Jacob's ladder. The ladder you do not climb. Now in Genesis chapter 28, verse 10. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. Now Jacob had both the birthright and the blessing, but I'm sure he didn't feel like that at this time. His mother has said, leave, your brother's gonna kill you. You need to leave and you wait until you hear from me. And that wait will be over 20 years before he returns. But he's leaving his homeland for the first time, fearing for his life, and as he was leaving his homeland, I'm sure he had some awareness of his own deceitfulness. Look what he did to his brother. He swindled him of the blessing, and he knew it. When he did what his mother told him to do, he knew it was wrong. He said, I may be found to be a deceiver to my father, and I'll bring a curse on myself rather than a blessing. And here he leaves home, and if someone would have said, Jacob, you're a hypocrite, he would have thought much more than you realize. Jacob, you're a deceiver. You haven't told the half. That is how Jacob felt. And he's on his journey to Haran, verse 11. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. Stones for pillows. 
That's pretty much representative of how he felt at this time. When's the last time you tried to use a stone for a pillow? Very uncomfortable, very alone. He didn't have anything at this time. I don't understand how he went away with nothing when his parents were so rich, but he did. On his way, fleeing his brother's wrath with stones for a pillow, very uncomfortable. Perhaps he even looked up at the sky and thought, I'm at a great distance from the God of my fathers, and I don't know how to get there. And there he lays with no comfort. Stones for pillows. It's night. It's night physically, and it's night spiritually for this man. He was in darkness. And there he lays on these stones. Verse 12, and he dreamed a dream. And he dreamed. Now, this was before the written word. And God communicated to him in this way. He communicated his word through dreams. We have his word now. We do not need dreams. I've had dreams that I should do something. I never do it. Even if I dream, I don't trust my dreams. Uh, we have the word of God. That's all we need. We don't need to trust anything else. But he didn't have that at this time. And he dreamed a dream and God communicated to him through this dream. And we're given such a beautiful type of the gospel in this dream in Christ being a ladder. And I love the simplicity of that, a ladder. A ladder brings me to a place that I couldn't reach without it. Very simple. No way I can get there without a ladder. And it was set up on the earth. Who set it up? God did. He brought it down from heaven and he set it up on the earth and it reached all the way to heaven. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now this ladder was on earth and it reached all the way to heaven. Now any man-made ladder is not going to get to heaven. You see, any man-made ladder will always have something you need to do and that ladder will always come up short. If there's anything you need to do before you can be in heaven, God can't bless you unless you fill in the blank. That's a ladder that will never reach heaven. It won't do you any good at all. You know, I thought of the message of uh, universal redemption. Jesus Christ paid for everybody's sins. He died for everybody. But it's up to you to accept him. And if you don't accept him, his death will do you no good. That's a ladder that doesn't get you to heaven. It doesn't get you there. It's, it's like a, a bridge that goes halfway across the river. It doesn't get you there. Anything that makes salvation in some way dependent upon something you need to do, some work you need to perform in order to be in heaven, it won't get you there. It's too short. Now, the fact that this ladder touched both heaven and earth speaks of Christ our mediator. He touches me on earth and he touches God in heaven and he brings us together. There's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And when we talk about Christ being a mediator, this is not like a human mediator seeking to get um, uh, people to negotiate, make concessions to come up with a mutual agreement. God doesn't negotiate with sinners. Never has, never will. This is not a mediation to try to negotiate and we can get together. Turn with me for a moment to Hebrews chapter 8. 
this is a, they're all critically important, but this is a critically important passage of scripture here in Hebrews chapter 8. Verse 6, but now hath he, the Lord Jesus, obtained a more excellent ministry. This is more excellent than the Levitical priesthood. This is more excellent than the law. He hath obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. Grace is better than works. The covenant of grace is infinitely better than the covenant of works. He's the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Now, the first covenant, God says, I'll do this if you do that. The covenant of grace, God says, I'll do this if Christ did that, and he did. That's my hope, not something I do, but what he did. That's a lot better promise, isn't it? If God said, I'll save you if you take the first step, it won't do you any good. If God says, I'll save you because Christ died for you and brought you into my presence, that's a better promise. For verse 7, if the first covenant had been faultless, let's talk about the law. Somebody says, are you saying the law is faulty? No, God says it. And here's how it's faulty. It doesn't save. I love God's law. I would never speak disrespectfully of God's law. I love the Ten Commandments. I love everything God says, but it won't save. It's faulty in that sense. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. This is the covenant of which Christ is the mediator that he brings us into contact with God through his person. And this is not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not. Now, if God takes you by the hand, you know how much good that's going to do you? Not a bit of good because your heart still is bad. He can get your hand and drag you around anywhere he wants but the heart's not changed. I need a new heart. I need a heart that he gives. I need that new heart that David spoke of when he said, create in me a clean heart. Oh God, create that in me. I can't, you know, one of the, religion always says, ask Jesus in your heart. Where in the world, where in the world is that in the Bible? It's not ask Jesus in your heart. Why would he want to go there? You ask him for a new heart. That's what I need. A new heart, the gift of his grace, create in me a clean heart, oh God. It won't do me any good for God to just take me by the hand. I have to be given a new heart. For this, verse 10, this is the covenant that I make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. Now, that's not talking about the Ten Commandments. As a matter of fact, Romans 2.16 says that that's already written on everybody's heart when you're born into this world. Everybody in this room, when you were a little boy or a little girl, you knew it was wrong to lie. The law was written in your heart. You knew it was wrong to steal. You knew it was wrong to murder and to kill because God's law is written in your heart. That's why, you know, when I hear people say we need to be taught how to live, you already know how to live. Do you know it's wrong uh, if you don't pay your bills? Sure you know that's wrong. It's dishonest. It's immoral. You know that and you don't have to have somebody say, you need to pay your bills. Well, that, 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 
That kind of stuff comes natural. You know it's wrong to lie. You know sexual sin is wrong. You know covetousness and greed is wrong. So he's not talking about writing the moral law in everybody's hearts because according to Romans 2.16, it's already there. He's talking about the law of the new nature, a new heart, a new spirit. You, you know, the law of faith. The, 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 there's, it, it's, it's a new creation in Christ. I'll put my laws in there. I'll put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And here's what I'll do next. I'll be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. Now, this is the way God's promise works. I will, you shall. I will, you shall. Every time, I will, you shall. Well, I like that, don't you? I, I want to be, you know, I've heard people, or people have said to me, you make people robots. Well, I don't, but I, yeah, I tell you what, I'm not sure that's a bad thing, are you? Would you like to be a robot in the sense of being programmed to do his will, just doing his will? Um, I'll put my law, my, I'll be to them a God. I'll be their God. If God be for you, who can be against you? They'll be to me a people. And they shall not, verse 11, they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. You know, this is what all of God's people have in common. They know the Lord. They know his character. And they know when he's not being preached. That's not the Lord I know. They know because they know the Lord. Every one of God's people, they all have this in common. They know the Lord. All shall know me from the least to the greatest, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. Now that word merciful is propitious. I will be a sin removing sacrifice to their righteousness uh, for um, their unrighteousness. Now this is what I need. I need God to do something about my sin. I can't do anything about it. That's not an excuse. That's not surrendering into I need God to do something about my sin. I need him to be propitious with regard to my sin to remove it by the sacrifice of Christ so I don't bear it anymore. That's what I need. And that's what every one of God's people need. And then he says next, I will be merciful or propitious to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Now, there's only one person who can do that. And the reason he doesn't remember many more is because through the propitiatory sacrifice of Christ, there's nothing there to remember. That's the only, God's got a lot better memory than me and you do. When he says their sins and iniquities, I remember no more. That's because there's nothing there to remember. Now, Christ is the mediator of this better covenant. I will and you shall. This ladder is let down from heaven on earth and it brings us to heaven. Just as the Lord said, Jacob saw these angels ascending and descending upon the ladder um, this lets us know that every blessing God has for me comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why I have it. No other reason. It comes to me through Christ. I don't care what blessing. I don't talk, care if it's justification, adoption, redemption, um, calling, election, all the glorious blessings of salvation. They come to me through Christ. They descend down through him. And I'm given them because of him. And now here's a, here's a New Testament uh, verse that um, emphasizes that. Be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Not because you were sorry, not because you asked for forgiveness. You ought to be sorry. You ought to ask for forgiveness. But that's not why God forgives. 
He does it through the ladder, through the mediator for Christ's sake. Every blessing God has, and every believer has every blessing God has in Christ, and they all descend down that ladder. And that prayer, that pathetic prayer that I offer up comes through the ladder all the way into heaven and is accepted by God. That weak, pathetic faith that I have comes through that ladder, the Lord Jesus Christ, and is accepted by God. Every blessing God has descends down the ladder, Christ, to me. Every even desire I have for him is acceptable to God, well-pleasing to God, because it's presented through the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn with me for, to Romans 10 for a moment. We have this notion of ascending and descending in Romans chapter 10. Verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Now, that's a ladder that reaches all the way to heaven, isn't it? That's Christ the ladder. He's the end. He's the goal. He's the completion. He's the purpose of the law. Christ, righteousness. The end of the law for righteousness to everyone believeth. Now, that's a ladder that reaches down to me on the earth and brings me all the way up into heaven. We never read of Jacob climbing this ladder or going up one rung at a time, getting higher. And No, that's, that's foolishness is all that is. He, Christ is the ladder. If you're on the first rung, you're already in heaven. You're there seated in the Ephesians 2, 6 says he's made us sit together with him in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus, already there. Is Christ already there? As he is. So are we in this world. Christ brings me into heaven. Now, this, this, there's the end of the law for righteousness. Now, verse 5. Here's a ladder that doesn't reach. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Hey, if you can keep the law perfectly, you'll be in heaven. What uh, percentage of a chance is that going to happen? It can't happen. It will not happen. Verse 6, but the righteousness which is of faith, this is the ladder that brings us into heaven. The righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven? What can I do that will ascend into heaven that will cause God to bless me? Don't say that. Don't say that. You think it all the time. What can I do? What can I do? There isn't a day that goes by where somehow in the flesh I think, what can I do to get God to respond to me? Don't say that. Don't even think it. Verse 7, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. Don't say, what can I do to make his death work for me? What can I do to do anything to get him to come? Forget doing. It's done. That is the only ladder that will bring me into heaven. It's done. What saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now, the latter is Christ himself. The angels of God represent every aspect of salvation coming to us through the latter. Every prayer, every desire we have comes to God through the latter. And you can think of, you think of the most uh, stupid, uh, uh, falling asleep while you're doing it, uh, uh, poor effort at prayer you've ever prayed, even seeing all kinds of bad motives in it and thinking, what, how in the world could that be heard? How could that get to heaven? Jesus Christ. He's the mediator. 
he touches God, he touches men. Now turn back to Genesis 28. Verse 12, and he dreamed and behold a ladder set up on the earth. Aren't you thankful the Lord already told us he's that ladder and somebody doesn't have to be thinking, well, I wonder if that really is what that means. Well, the Lord tells us that's what it is. You're going to see the angels of God descending and descending on me. I mean, this is not somebody stretching for something. This is Christ, the ladder. And behold, verse 13, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, the God of Isaac, the land whereon thy lies, to thee will I give it and to thy seed. And that's what he heard from the top of the ladder, who God is, I am. He heard of the covenant God, I'm the God of Abraham and Isaac, your grandfather and your father, the covenant God, and I will give. The land wherein thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed, the gift of his grace through the latter. Verse 14, and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east. Now remember, he didn't have any kids. And here God is telling them of this vast multitude. And it represents all of God's people, the seed of Abraham, the, the elect. They, they all come through him. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in thee, and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, Paul tells us that that's the gospel in Galatians 3, 8. In thee, in, in your seed. And that's talking about the coming seed, the Lord Jesus Christ. All nations shall be blessed. Not they will be blessed if. They shall be blessed. That's the gospel. God's blessing for Christ's sake in Christ. And behold, verse 15, I am with thee. What else can anybody want? What else could you want? The Lord's my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. I am with thee. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. The Lord's with me. He's with me right now. And you know, most of the time, I'm not even aware of it. I'll... Turn on the TV when I get home, watch something silly, and the Lord's still with me. He's with me. When I get up in the morning and read the paper, and I'm not even thinking about him reading the paper, he's with me. When I'm giving grace to rest in him, trust him, behold his beauty, behold, he's with me. But the point is, he's always, there's never a time when he's not with his people. I love the way the High priest had the names of the children of Israel engraven on his breast, on his shoulder of peace, always with him. I will keep thee in all places where thou goest. Now, if a believer could fall away, they would fall away. If I could fall away, I would fall away. There's no question about that. But because I can't, I won't. And the reason I can't is because he keeps me. He said, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest and will bring thee again into this land. For I'll not leave thee until I've done that which I have spoken to thee of. Covenant blessings. I love what David said in 2 Samuel 23, 5. Although my house be not so with God, yet hath he made with me an everlasting covenant ordered in all things and sure. And that's what's being spoken of here. And this is all my salvation. 
Is that all your salvation? And you can answer that with a yes or no. Is what David called all my salvation, although my house be not so with God, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant ordered in all things and sure. And this is all my salvation. And this is all my desire. I don't want anything else. Verse 16. Jacob awaked out of his sleep. And said, surely the Lord's in this place. And I knew it not. A lot of people say this is when he was converted. Or brought to a knowledge of God, I don't know. It may be. Um, Jacob awaked out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid. Now, one thing I know, if I know God, I'm going to have to fear God. What was his response? He was afraid. He said, How dreadful is this place? He was afraid. Now, what is the fear of God? The fear of God is is being afraid to look anywhere but Christ. You find no comfort. You find no assurance. You find no confidence in anything but the person of Christ. And you, you have such a, a high, exalted view of God that you're scared to death to look anywhere but Christ. And your desire is, oh, that I might be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is of the law. I don't want to have anything to do with that. But that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. He was afraid and he said, how dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, house of God. But the name of that city was called Luz at first, that place where he was at. Now, everybody I read um, said in verses 20 through 22, Jacob is going back to character. He's trying to strike a deal with God. Let's read these verses together. And Jacob, after this dream, after the Lord made himself known to him, and Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I've set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Now, like I said, everybody I read with that exception said Jacob is uh, living up to his character at this time. He's always trying to drive a bargain. Now, God, if you do this, if you save me, if you keep me, if you preserve me, if you give me everything I need, I'll give you a tenth back. Is that what is being taught here? If you do all this for me, you'll be my God and I'll give you 10% of my income. It's all his anyway. It's all his. Now, what he is saying is if the Lord does this for me, he will be my God. He's done something for me. He will be my God. Somebody says, where's this tenth come in? Well, what did uh, Abraham give Melchizedek before the giving of the law? A tenth. Uh, the Jacob before the giving of the law promises a tenth. Does the New Testament teach tithing? giving 10%? Let me answer that question real simply, no. No. 
Let me say it again. No. What does the New Testament teach? Well, give as God has prospered you. Let every man according to as he purposes in his heart, so let him give. You know, if I give as God prospers me, I might give a whole lot more than a tenth. I may be in a position where I would be unable to give a tenth. You give as God has prospered you. But here is the point of this. When God reveals himself to you, you want to be rich toward him. You want to be generous toward him. To put a amount is never right. Uh, is there anything in the Bible, in the New Testament, about giving 10%? No, there's not. As a man purposes in his heart, so let him give. Let him give as, as God has prospered you. That's, that's the rule of giving. But here's the point. If I love Christ, I want to give. It's a love issue. If you love somebody, you want to give to that person. This is a love issue. And this is a faith issue. Well, I'm praying I'll need that money for something else. You trust the Lord for something else. It's a love issue, and it's a faith issue. And Jacob says when God shows him this ladder, he never climbed a ring, a rung, did he? It was a ladder that brought him directly into God's presence. It came down to him where he was in that field sleeping on rocks and brought him directly into God's presence, the work of Christ. And God makes all these promises, these covenant promises. I'll be with you. I'll keep you. I'll preserve you. I'll bring you back here in peace, the peace of justification, the peace of Christ being all in salvation. I'll bring you back here in peace. Well, well, Jacob says, well, if the Lord does that, he's my God. <laughs> he's done something for me. He's done a mighty work of grace in my heart. And I want to be generous toward him. Let's pray. Lord, how we thank you for Christ, our ladder. How he brings us into your very presence and causes our prayers to be accepted by you through our ladder. How we thank you that every blessing of salvation is given us in and through thy son, the Lord Jesus Christ. How we thank you for the revelation of your gospel. Lord, once again, we pray for your blessing on the Vacation Bible School. We pray that you would make yourself known to these young people for Christ's sake. In his name we pray. Amen. Uh,